All right, let's get started. A uh, reminder that the video for your mini project is due on Monday, uh, just before midnight. Uh, again, please do remember to form your group again on Autolab before submitting. Uh, thanks again for all those of you who have given me feedback. If you still have not and want to, please go ahead and do it. I plan to go over it in more detail over the weekend and maybe po uh, put up a post uh, with some comments. Um, I realized yesterday I had been promising you guys a bunch of links over various lectures and never following up. So here are kind of three things that I had promised you guys. Uh, the first one is a paper that formally defines what a greedy algorithm is. Uh, the second one is about sorting algorithms that run faster if your input is already kind of sorted. And the last one is just support page that kind of tries to demystify the identity we saw for, uh, that we used in integer multiplication um, last, uh, on, uh, on Monday. I'm hoping homework five getting should be done by today. Um, I will, of course, post once it's finally done. Any questions on logistics uh, before we get started? All right, so today we are going to look at this generic problem of ranking. Um, and in particular, uh, this is a very rich field. You can teach multiple courses just on ranking and voting and things like that. Um, what we're going to focus on is a very specific uh, version of, uh, of the ranking problem. And in particular, let's say you run uh, a search term on two different engines. This is Google and Bing. Um, and if someone want to answer, they implicitly give you ranking on various web pages that are relevant. And now, say if you are a search engine aggregator that will aggregate results from multiple search engines and give one output to the, uh, to the user, one of the problems you'd like to solve is if I give you two rankings, how close are they? Right. And this is not something that's just used in this uh, online search uh, aggregators, but even for things like Netflix. Right. So the way you get recommendations is Netflix tries to figure out from your preferences, who are the other users that have preferences that are close to you? And then use their viewing history to recommend uh, like movies or shows for you. So we'll formalize, uh, and, and there are various notions of, um, defining the closeness between two rankings. We are going to look at one, which is counting the number of inversions. We've already seen inversions before when we're trying to analyze the greedy algorithm to minimize the maximum lateness. But now we're going to see how it will, uh, how you can use the number of inversions itself as um, like a formal way to define distance between two rankings. And then we're going to look at a divide and conquer algorithm to solve this problem. Um, and again, just as a quick reminder, here's kind of the three step. You divide the problem into two or more sub problems. You recursively solve these sub problems and then you patch things up, right? Uh, so one thing I want to point out is the step of recursively solving the sub problems. Uh, we'll basically see kind of three flavors of this out of which we've already seen two. Uh, so the first one is just, you just divide things up and just blindly solve all the sub-problems. So this is what we did for Mozart, divided into two sub-problems, solve them both. And integer multiplication, we had to be a bit more clever. So after we divided everything into sub-problems, we realized if you just solve all of them blindly, then you're not getting any runtime improvement. And so the game there is how can you solve a fewer number than the trivial number of sub-problems to solve the problem. And something that we're going to see today, it turns out that sometimes it's actually easier to design an algorithm for a stronger problem. And so uh, that's something uh, you should keep in mind and something uh, that we'll see today. Okay. Uh, but any questions before I get started? So 
it turns out uh, that the problem that Netflix tries to solve has a name, it's called collaborative filtering. And Netflix is probably the most prominent example of this, but this is true for pretty much any system that recommends things to you. And I, I won't be giving you the, you know, the full-blown problem that Netflix actually solves because, among other things, I don't know what is the exact problem they solve. But I'll try to give you a sense of what, uh, in a general level, what this problem is. Um, and then we'll actually make a very strong simplifying assumption just because it makes what we're going to talk about today easier. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and try to solve that problem. So, again, think of Netflix uh, as the example, and you think of each user as equivalent to representing each user by basically your ranking of the most uh, movies or shows. Okay, so so a user is for this problem is equivalent to a ranking on movies or shows. And the hypothesis that's used by Netflix is if you have two rankings that are similar corresponding to two different users, their tastes are going to be similar. Right? Um, so in some ones, so you'll say user one is close to user two if user one's ranking is close to user two's ranking. And again, the basic reason why Netflix wants to do this is you take rankings from two different users, they're never complete, right? So, you, I mean, there are certain shows and movies that you have not seen, but someone else might have seen. And then you take two users and find if their rankings are similar, you recommend the shows that one person has seen but not the other one to the other person. Right? So the idea is using ranking as a proxy of saying, well, these two users have similar tastes, and once you have two users that have similar tastes, you would recommend movies or shows that one has seen but the other has not seen. Right? That's the basic idea. And now that I've said it, I'm just going to make an assumption that we completely obliterate this whole um, realistic thing. But we need this assumption to kind of uh, make the problem more tractable. Okay? So we are going to assume that every user actually ranks all the movies and shows on Netflix. Right? Uh, so each user, I'm running out. ranks all movies or shows. And this is definitely unrealistic, but we are making this assumption to make kind of the problem more tra tractable, okay? And when I say ranking, so again, there, there's two notions of ranking. On Netflix, you rank every show from a number from one to five, right? So, you know, least preferred to most preferred. Uh, whereas in this problem, we're going to assume not only do you, I mean, you assign if there are n movies and shows, you're going to assign the numbers from one to n. So you're strictly ranking all of the movies and shows as in most preferred to second most preferred to third most preferred and so on and so forth. Okay. And again, I said this is not realistic for the Netflix thing, but this helps simplify the problem so that we can uh, tackle it. All right, so we, our input, so the final problem that we're going to look at is a ranking. So in our case, ranking would be just n numbers. And so these n numbers are a permutation of one to n. So you assume there is some unknown, um, so again, going back to the Netflix case, you have user one and user two and you have ranking for one and the ranking for other. 
for the purposes of figuring out if these two guys are close, you just assume that one of them is kind of the true ranking and you're trying to figure out whether the other one is close to that or not. Okay? So we're going to assume that these a1 to n is a permutation from 1 to n. That is, it's just some ways you have jumbled a 1 to n. Um, yeah. So how can you, if everyone is already ranked? You cannot use this for recommendation, yes. Isn't that already like solved yet, that, that the recommendation is already solved? Yes, so that's why I said this is unrealistic. Yeah, so I was, unfortunately a bait and switch kind of thing. I say, oh, Netflix collaborate with thing, great, and then I tell you a problem that is related but not quite solving the problem that you want. Okay. So again, the, the, the reason is not that, uh, you know, um, this problem mathematically is still very interesting to compute two different rankings and to do it. And it turns out if you, even if you want to solve the earlier problem, right, the actual problem where not everything is ranked, if you can't solve this simpler version, you're not going to be able to solve that version. Right, so we want to solve the simpler one. Alejandro. So what are we actually trying to solve here? I'll just say it. I'm not done defining the problem. Mark. Are these rankings from best to worst, or are they just like ratings? Uh, so they're just from your complete, you have a total ranking of all the N shows. So if you have shows from 1 to N, this A1 to AN would be, let's say, my top show is 10, then 20, and then 30, and but all the numbers from 1 to N have to be present. Okay. So it's a permutation of 1 to N, and so this ordering of 1 to N is what we'll consider to be the true ranking. And what you want to output is the number of inversions. Okay, so recall that i comma j is an inversion if i comes before j and AI is strictly bigger than AJ. So again, another way to think about this is we are thinking that the correct ranking uh, or the true ranking is one, two, three, all the way up to N. Now you're given a permutation of these one to N, which is A1 to AN, and you want to find out how many of these pairs AI, AJ are not in the right order. Right? And, uh, all right, so this, this is the problem you want to solve. So just to give a sense of, uh, of these things, uh, before I go on, any questions? Okay, so let's look at two examples. So the first example is when this input a1 to n is exactly the same as true ordering right so a1 is 1 a2 is 2 and so on and so forth in this case if you look at any pair i and j where i is strictly smaller than j ai is going to be strictly smaller than j so none of the pairs are inversions here okay so here number of inversions is zero as none of the pairs ij for i less than j is an inversion and note that if you ever have something that is zero number of inversions that is the smallest you can do because you're counting the number of pairs that are inversions so that number can never be smaller than zero so this is the smallest possible value. Any questions? All right, let's look at a, an example where uh, the a1 to n is in the exact reverse order of 1 to n. So I have n, n minus 1, all the way up to 1. Now in this case, if you look at any quantity here, any quantity here, the smaller index value is larger than the larger index value. Right? So every pair is an inversion. Right? So in this case, 
every pair is an inversion so that implies number of inversions the same as the number of possible pairs ij such so that i is strictly smaller than j and that's n choose 2 and this is the maximum possible value so if i give you an arbitrary permutation of 1 to n a1 through a n you know it cannot be smaller than zero and you know it cannot be larger than n choose two and so the question is where does it fall in this range so that that's the answer you have to give me so what i like you to do is so talk to your friends and try to think of a brute force algorithm and the hint is, in this case, brute force is actually O of n squared. Okay. So try to think of O of n squared time algorithm to solve this problem. Oh, sorry. All right, uh, can I have your attention, please? Sorry? Uh, oh, so you're saying the solution is nested for loops, okay, and then you do what? Right, so the simplest thing to do is check all possible pairs, i, j, such so that i is strictly smaller than j, and then just check whether it's an inversion, check whether a, i is strictly bigger than c, j. All right, so, so the solution here is check all n choose two pairs i j such that i is strictly less than j and if a i is strictly bigger than j then increase count. So you just maintain a counter, go over all possible pairs. If a pair is an uh, inversion, increment the counter, otherwise leave it be. Okay. And since you're looking at n choose two pairs, this is why this is uh, O of n squared. Okay. And so this is O of n squared. So before we go on, I like to make a observation, which is, Let's say I change the problem slightly. So I've asked you to count the number of inversions, right? But say I, for whatever reason, I change my mind and say, well, not only do you need to give me a count of number of inversions, I want you to list all the inversions that are there, right? So it's not just the count, but you actually want a list of all the pairs that are inversions. In that case, this brute force algorithm is optimal because you have, uh, you have this input, 
where you have to output all possible pairs. So the output size by itself is n squared. So in the worst case, you cannot do any better. Okay? So let me uh, write it down. Uh, so the observation is if you had to output a list of all inversions, then brute force algorithm is optimal. This is because example two has output size which is omega n squared. So in the worst case, sorry, in the worst case there exists an input where your algorithm has to output n squared pairs. Since it has to output each one of them, you will need omega n squared time anyways. And brute force algorithm always runs in O of n squared. Right? So in the worst case, if we had to list all the inversions, the brute force algorithm was the best you could do. So in particular, if we want to improve upon O of n squared, which is our goal, we cannot have an algorithm that explicitly lists all the inversions too, right? So it has to figure out some way of counting faster than listing, okay? So our goal is to count number of inversions faster than O of n squared. That means I cannot compute all inversions. And typically for, or I say typically for many problems, the counting problem is easier than listing and precisely because of these reasons. Because in many problems, if you just had to list, your output size is going to be so huge that you're going to spend a bunch of time just outputting whatever you need to output. Whereas if you're allowed to just count, then you can do something much faster, okay? Uh, Any questions? Alex? Would this problem be used to then compare how similar to the Right, so I said just to go back to uh, what we started off with, uh, with the unrealistic assumption that everyone ranks everything, if the way you solve this is, right, so you take rankings of two users, find the number of inversions between them, the closer it is to zero, the closer they are to each other. So that, that's my definition of uh, when two rankings are close. Any other questions? Okay, so, um, not surprisingly, since we have been doing divide and conquer algorithms, we're going to do a divide and conquer algorithm for that. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to tell you the obvious algorithm that one might come up with, and I'm telling you upfront that the algorithm is wrong. So here's what I want you guys to do. While I'm stating the algorithm, pay close attention and try to figure out where the algorithm goes wrong. Okay? All right. So we'll do a divider and conquer algorithm. Uh, I'll just call it count in, takes as an input A and N. If, if it has only one element, there cannot be any inversion because it has zero number of pairs. Right? So in this case, then we return zero. If n is equal to two, then you return a1 bigger than a0. Um, I'm basically using C or C++ semantics, so this evaluates to one if this equality is true, otherwise it evaluates to zero. So they're saying output one, uh, sorry. 
sorry, um, and I should have mentioned this more forcefully before I'm starting the indexing from one and not zero. So if the first number is strictly bigger than the second number, then that's an inversion. Uh, if it is not, then you output one, otherwise you output zero. Okay. Otherwise, you do what we did for mod sort, divide the array into two parts. Um, so you have A1 all the way up to A ceiling of N over two. A right is pretty much everything that remains. Then I'll call the uh, algorithm recursively on the left and right part. So I'll call the algorithm on the left part with n over 2. I'll call the algorithm on the right part n over 2. The number of inversions, obviously, I mean, the test, I mean, and then what I say is just add them up and return. Okay. So what I want to do is talk to your friend for half a minute and figure out where this algorithm is wrong. Questions before we move on? If not, any thoughts on what's going wrong here? Matt? Right, so the issue is you're dividing the array into two parts, left and right. You are recursively counting inversions that are contained within the left part and the right part, but you're not counting inversions that cross over. Right. So, for example, so here is a specific example. So let's say I have n is equal to four, so the left half is one and hundred, and the second half is two and four. Now, note that both of these. Uh, sub-arrays don't have any inversion between them, right? So th they are sorted. But all the inversions are actually crossing. Right? So, uh, so 102 is an inversion, 104 is an inversion. So the algorithm will not count the crossing inversions. So is everyone okay where the algorithm is going wrong? Okay. So in other words, the patch up problem that we have to do once we figure out what are the inversions in left part and right part is somehow compute the inversions that are crossing between left and between right. Okay. Um, So let's see. And in fact, I mean, this could go horribly wrong, right? So it's, it could be the case that your input is so that all the inversions are crossing inversions, right? So your algorithm could go and do all of these things recursively, return a zero. Whereas, for example, there could be bunch and bunch of inversions, even up to omega n squared inversions, right? So this algorithm, not only is it wrong, it can be nowhere close to the actual optimal value either. 
Um, so I had said problem case what if all the inversions were crossing inversions. Okay. So in some sense, th this case is kind of like the hardest instance for this flawed algorithm, right? So, um, which is kind of a bummer. I mean, uh, this is because a nice, sweet, simple algorithm that if it would work would have been nice. Um, but here you use the analogy of, you know, if your life gives you lemons, then make lemonade. So we're going to attack this hard instance straight up. Okay. So, uh, so consider the bad case where all inversions are crossing inversions. So what I mean by that is once you divide everything into the left part and the right part, all the inversions are crossing, you never have a pair between just the left part itself and the right part itself that's um, that, that's an inversion. So let's look at this bad example. Uh, so, so what I'm telling you is the, all the inversions are between the left part and the right part. In particular, if you just looked at AL, there are no inversions in AL. If you just look at AR, there are no inversions within AR. If you have these two arrays that don't have any inversions, what can you tell about their sortedness? Mark. They're both sorted. They're both sorted. So the fact that if it is indeed the case that all the inversions are crossing inversions, then it necessarily has to mean that both the left part and the right part are sorted. Right? So it tells us something a lot more about the input. Okay. So this implies both A of L and A of R are sorted. So what I'm going to try to do next is just try to solve this special case. So let's assume our input is so that the left part is given to us sorted, the right part is given to us sorted, but there could be crossing in both. And so you have a problem where you're given two lists or two arrays that are sorted, and you somehow want to combine them, right? Sorry? Sorry? Right, so the idea is, I won't say merge sort, I would say merge. So remember the merge algorithm that took two sorted arrays and combined them into one sorted array? We are essentially going to use that algorithm, tweak it slightly so that it can do, you can do this count, okay? So see, to see why this would be useful, and in particular, if you're doing that, we somehow have to count a lot of inversions quickly, right? So in particular, if my example has omega n squared inversions, this algorithm should be able to count the total number of inversions quickly. And we show that you can do that precisely because the left part and the right part are sorted. Okay? So to see an intuition about this, uh, so here's the first claim. The above case can be solved in O of n time. So exactly the same runtime as uh, for the merge algorithm. And to get the intuition for this, consider uh, the following uh, example. Or rather, I'll show you the left part and the right part and the, just the first two entries. So you have one and 100 and a bunch of things. You have two and four, then a bunch of things. So the initial two uh, positions are exactly the bad example uh, we had seen earlier. 
and like in Moj algorithm, we'll have an index into the left part and the right part, and we'll start off with the top guy in both cases. Okay. So I have I over here. I have J over here. So the case one is, let's say, uh, location I in A left is strictly smaller than location J in the right part. So again, to begin with, I have the top, top, uh, the, more, the smallest number in both left and right. I compare them. And in this case, I see that the top guy on the left part is smaller than or equal to the top pi on the right guy. So one thing we immediately know that i comma j is not an inversion. Right? So this obviously implies i comma j is not an inversion, which is fine. But again, we are not kind of. So I said our algorithm must do something where we are counting lots of inversions together or alternatively ruling out bunch of pairs in one sweep instead of going through all of them one by one. So if I know i is smaller than or equal to j and this guy is already sorted, that means i is smaller than the second guy here, the third guy here, the fourth guy here, indeed it's smaller than everything on the right. Okay. So not only can we say i comma j is not an inversion, we can say i comma j prime for all j prime greater than or equal to j is not an inversion. So with this just one comparison, if it turns out that the ith guy in the left is smaller than or equal to the jth guy in the right, I'm able to rule out everything. So all the pairs i and all the j's over here cannot be inversions. In other words, I can forget about having to count how many inversions i participates in. I can just move on. Because you know, it, it cannot be an inversion with anything. Okay. So this implies I can advance i by just doing i plus plus. Right. So let's do that in this example. So I move this guy over. And this is my new i. And this gives me to, gets me to the other, um, other case, which is, in this case, now the ith guy here is strictly larger than the jth guy here. So it's, it's the reverse of what we had. Okay. So location i in al is strictly larger than location j in ar. Now, in this case, I know i comma j is an inversion. Right? Because I, I'm saying this guy comes before this, but this is bigger than this. Alejandro? Uh, look, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, location i in the left part is bigger than location j. So I know that i comma j is an inversion, but I know something more. Do any of you see what else can I say? So I claim there are a bunch of other inversions that involve j. Mark. Right, so not only is i comma j is an inversion, but all of these numbers are bigger than 100. Right, so they'll all be bigger than 2. So not only is i comma j an inversion, but all of the i's over here comma j are also inversions. Okay. So not only that, it's i prime comma j for all i prime greater than or equal to i are all inversions. And the point is, to figure out how many of these there are, I don't need to walk through them. I just need to know how large this AL is. Right? So let's say I know that uh, this is not a good, but let's say there are n prime entries in AL. And I know I am at the ith location. So this implies I have n prime minus i plus 1 inversions. And again, I know this immediately without having to walk through the rest of the array. And not only that, I basically now handled all the inversions that j could have been involved with. 
so I can advance J now. Okay. Plus advance J. So let me tell you the general algorithm. So in general, what I have is my left guy and just for to make the indexing easier let's say these are uh, l1 l2 up to ln prime and the right part is r1 r2 all the way up to say rm that's why i have two uh, arrays both of which are sorted one has n prime guys and the other has m guys and my goal is to count all pairs i j such that the left the l i so if i have i over here and j over here l i is strictly bigger than r j okay so th this is my goal this is what i want to do and the algorithm is i basically have done it I, i'll just check uh, the top guy is the i and j guy, depending on which is smaller and larger, either I'll rule out a bunch of pairs being inversions, or I count a bunch of pairs being inversions. So, uh, we'll call this the merge count algorithm. So in this case, I'm given the left part and the right part. So I have some count that I initialize to zero, I have two indices that I initialize to the start of the left and the right part. And like in the merge algorithm, I'll keep on continuing till I'm not done with at least one of these two left or right parts. So while i is less than or equal to n prime and j is less than or equal to m, I look at whether the ith guy is smaller than if, if let's see. I check if the i guy in the left part is smaller than or equal to the j guy in the right part. So if l i is less than or equal to r j, then all I need to do is just increment the pointer to the left part. Right? I, I've just argued that this is not going to participate in any further inversions going forward. Otherwise, I can increment my count by whatever remains at the end, so which is n prime minus i plus one. And in that case, I need to increment j odds. Okay, and that's it. So, it's fairly, so if you look at, uh, it's, it's a fairly simple generalization or a modification of the merge algorithm. So talk to your friends for half a minute, a minute. Let me know if you have any questions. If, if you're okay with this, we're almost done. We'll just do one more. We'll, we'll observe one more thing and we'll be done. Alex. What represents the number of inversions in that? In that C is the number of inversions. Yeah. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, I should always return that value, I guess. Which you can't see. Yeah, Mark. So we're assuming the left and right are sorted. Do we have to sort them as we go back up the... Hold on to that thought. Any questions on this merge count algorithm itself? Okay. 
by the way proving the correctness of this algorithm is a nice exercise so i'll encourage you to go and uh, do it at the home uh, again you can prove it by induction and it works so the next question that comes up is what uh, mark asked so remember this was just kind of the last step that you wanted to do in the divide and conquer algorithm right so the idea was you, you recursively solve this problem and then at, at the end you somehow have a sorted left part and a sorted right part and then you try to count the number of inversions between them right but i mean if you're just solving the original problem there is no there's no guarantee that would be the case because all that was saying was just count the number of inversions right? so the trick in this case i mentioned at the beginning of the lecture is to try to solve a stronger problem so instead of just trying to count the number of inversions let's say the problem is you count the number of inversions and also sort the array so the recursive problem you're trying to solve is count the number of inversions but also sort the array so if you do that when you come back at the end you have left half and right half because you have already done the recursive call to count inversions plus sort count inversions plus sort these two guys will be already sorted and then you apply this algorithm okay so the merge step or the patch up phase is not just counting the number of inversions of these two sorted arrays but also merge them but we already know how to do that that was the merge algorithm and we've already seen it okay so i'm matthew you've given us the uh, iterative uh, version there's also recursive yeah so i'm coming to that so this is just kind of how you combine the last two parts together okay. so i'm not giving you the entire algorithm so let me just state one property uh, this is laid out in the book so it shouldn't be a problem but what you can do is modify this algorithm to also sort the merged al and ar okay and all you have to do is basically change few lines here and here and, and you're done so uh, let's go back to All right, so here's kind of now that we have this function that given two sorted arrays counts the number of crossing inversions and also merges them into one sorted array. So uh, we're going to do what we'll call the merge count algorithm. And um, so I said the problem we're trying to solve is not just counting the number of inversions, but also actually sort the numbers uh, in increasing order. So initially, if n is equal to 1, then you have zero number of inversions, and the sorted thing is just a1. If n is equal to 2, if you have returned 1 if a1 is bigger than a2, otherwise the, and then the sorted thing is the minimum followed by the maximum. Then you divide the array of length n into the first n over 2 and the last n over 2. You recursively call merge sort count on the left part, merge sort count on the right part, now you'll get two things the number of uh, inversions that were within just the left part is c of l the number of inversions within just the right part is c of r but now the left and the right part are also sorted okay. then what i do is just apply merge count on the sorted left part and right part and that will give me the total number of crossing inversions but it will also give me the union of these two or the merged arrays that's in sorted order. So I said, uh, this is uh, the version that we didn't get time to fully go through, uh, but you can not only count the number of crossing inversions between the sorted left part and right part, but you can merge them into one sorted array. And then what you return is the number of inversions in the left part, number of inversions in the right part, and the crossing number of inversions. And since A is sorted, that's what you have. Okay. If you only wanted to count the total number of inversions, you run this algorithm, throw away the sorted part. Are there any questions? Do any of you want me to quickly go over how to modify the merge count algorithm to actually do the merging also? Yes. Okay. Okay. 
So all you have to do in this case, uh, when the the top, the ith guy over here is smaller than this guy, it means li should next go to the output, right? So over here, what you have to add is append li to output. Over here, you should append the jth guy because that's the smaller guy. So you append j to output. And once you come out of this while loop, it might still be the case that you have not handled one of the two guys completely. So if that's the case, you should just output whatever is remaining uh, to the end. So you'll have a 2.5 that says append whatever remains to the output. So maybe I'll box these guys to stress the parts that we added. But note that if you replace these guys with this part, uh, I mean, if you were just not counting this guy over here and just removed everything that had to do with count, you will recover exactly the merge algorithm that you've seen before, right? So this algorithm to count the number of crossing inversions as well as merge to sorted arrays is basically just adding few lines where you count the number of inversions to the merge algorithm. All right, uh, sorry for going over a bit. I'll see you guys on Friday.